Ladies and gentlemen, the Army leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the presentation of the colors and the singing of the national anthem by the United States Army Band, Pershing Zone, conducted this morning by their leader and commander, Colonel Andrew Esch. Please remain standing for the invocation by Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel James Foster, Deputy Command Chaplain for the U.S. Army Military District of Washington, followed by the retiring of the colors. Thank you for taking a moment of prayer with me at this time. Almighty God, for your presence in our lives today, I give you thanks. You are the master of transforming lives, and you hold the future in your hands. So God, bring the change and transformation we need in the days ahead. We want a bright and prosperous future, one that is full of hope and promise, one where every person in this great nation recognizes their worth and contribution to the whole. Bless our nation, and God bless the United States Army. Bless those in this room who strive to educate, inform, and connect to support a positive transformation in the Army. And now in this conference, bring your blessing upon us. God, help us to walk in wisdom according to your will in every decision and in this celebration. In your holy name I pray, amen. Please be seated. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Association of the United States Army, General Robert Brooks Brown, United States Army, retired. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Yeah. Isn't it great, absolutely terrific, to be back in person? Really nothing like it. I mean, virtual was OK, but nothing like face to face. So welcome to the 2021 annual meeting of the Association of the United States Army. And we never forget why we're here, to support our soldiers, regular Army, Army National Guard, and Army Reserve, their families, dedicated Army civilians. Your association supports retirees, veterans, and the incredible businesses, large and small, who provide the material and services which make our Army so great. For over 246 years, American soldiers have fulfilled their oaths in the service of our nation. And for the past 71 years, the Association of the United States Army has been privileged to support the greatest land force on the planet. Today in your audience, there are many soldiers who have served in harm's way defending America's freedom. And we are honored to have these brave men and women with us. I would, though, single out an extraordinary hero, Medal of Honor recipient, Master Sergeant Retired, Leroy Petrie. Leroy. Please stand up and be recognized. We are honored this morning to welcome several Gold Star families. And while we can never repay the debt we owe you, we can promise you that we will never forget, and we will do all we can to honor our fallen heroes. <laughs> Welcome to our Secretary of the Army, our Chief of Staff of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army, and other members of our Army leadership are here with us. We do have a former Chief of Staff, the 33rd Chief of Staff of the Army, General Dennis Reimer, joining us today. Thanks for joining us, sir. And we have three former Sergeants Major of the Army, Jack Tilley, Ken Preston, and Dan Daly. Cool. So thanks to all of you for joining us. And now, let's watch listen and learn from the soldiers of the Military District of Washington. Good morning and welcome back to the AUSA Annual Meeting. My name is Master Sergeant Matthew Knoll. I'm Staff Sergeant Keenan McCarter, and today is a great day to be in the United States Army. The world has changed since the last time we were together in this room, but the United States Army is still rolling along. For 246 years, the Army has remained at the forefront of change, and some of you here in this room and watching online have been a part of the foundational transformations of the last 50 years. We are proud to stand here and say that the United States Army's commitment to defend our country's values and principles, no matter the enemy or the odds, is stronger than it has ever been. Being a soldier is more than a job, more than a career. Being a soldier is a profession. Being a soldier is committing ourselves to protecting the ideals of the U.S. Constitution. The United States Army has never accepted what others say can't be done. We've never been comfortable with the status quo. We continue to enhance the way we recruit and train the most diverse and forward-thinking talent pool in the world. 
we turn what others call insurmountable obstacles into immeasurable opportunities to serve the people of the United States and to support our allies and partners. The Army's greatest strength is its people, soldiers, civilians, and families. And taking care of those people is the Army's number one priority. This is especially evident in our commitment to scientific discovery and medical advances to maximize performance, recovery, and injury prevention. During the Vietnam War, Army medical teams revolutionized first responder capabilities on the battlefield and beyond. Helicopter medical evacuations, more commonly known as dust-offs, pioneered advanced life-saving techniques that remain the benchmark in both military and civilian emergency medical care. The use of advanced topical treatments for burn victims, as well as the use of typo blood, have greatly improved the outcome for our wounded soldiers. Today, in addition to a total Army response to the ongoing COVID pandemic, the Army has continued to transform medical response and treatment. Tactical combat casualty care trains soldiers on the most up-to-date battlefield trauma care techniques. State-of-the-art prosthetics and cutting-edge physical therapy treatments are available as a result of the efforts of the Army and Joint Force Medical Development. The Army knew that large-scale operations after Vietnam would require advanced technology and integration of air and ground joint forces. Coming out of Vietnam, research and development was already underway for what would become the foundation of the Army's combat formation, the Big Five. Nearly 20 years later, the Army's commitment to innovation and modernization brought a swift and decisive victory over Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi Republican Guard. Today, the Army Modernization Strategy describes how the Army will ensure we are prepared to compete, deter, fight, and win when the nation calls. The Army's six modernization priorities is only the beginning of our commitment to fighting the enemies of tomorrow. Strategic partnerships with key industry and academic institutions are propelling advancements in fields like artificial intelligence and quantum research. Our investments in technology today will redefine what it means to bring the fight to the enemy in 2035 and beyond in all domain operations. Modernizing our equipment is only one step in the process. Being ready for large-scale combat operations requires a fundamental shift in our strategy and tactics. American tactical innovation during Vietnam, such as the Army's air mobility concept, made it possible to rapidly deploy soldiers and critical supplies to decisive points on the battlefield. Simultaneously, the development of special operations forces allowed American soldiers to better train indigenous forces and interact with civilian populations. From the Cold War to today's great power competition, the Army has continually expanded and refined our tactical readiness and strategic capabilities. Multi-domain operations are the Army's most comprehensive performance strategy since the late 1970s. We're advancing nearly every aspect of what we fight, what we fight with, and how we train. As long as we continue to motivate, innovate, and put our people first, we remain the unrivaled world leader in ground combat operations. In 1973, the draft era came to an end, and our Army enhanced the way we recruit, train, develop, and lead our men and women. We are focused on service, strong values, and character. Much like a sports team recruits the best athlete for position, the Army is focused on finding the very best our nation has to offer, including an all-volunteer force focused on our Army values of loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. The Army recruits all people who meet the standard and provides an opportunity to serve a bigger cause than themselves and live the Army values. Recruits have a chance to serve in any of our over 150 different military occupational specialties. Our Army remains focused on a culture of commitment 
competence, character, and caring. Today, we support a professional environment where everyone can thrive and excel as far as their talents can take them, both as an individual and as a team. Leaders shape the course of the Army. Over time, the Army has encouraged the development of transformational leaders of all ranks and at all levels. During the Vietnam era, the Office of Sergeant Major of the Army was established, and a new emphasis was placed on management of enlisted personnel, training, and development of non-commissioned officers. The transformation to an all-volunteer force led to the formalization of professional standards throughout the organization. Advancement of professional military education formed the foundation of who we are today and continues to shape the Army as a profession. Leadership involves training, preparing, and developing soldiers to do the right thing, the right way, at the right time. Our soldiers look to us to lead the way with selfless service, courage, and commitment. No matter our rank or our organization, it is the privilege of everyone who wears this uniform to set an exceptional personal example and live the Army values. By staying fit, disciplined, and proficient in our skills, leading and caring for soldiers and their families, we remain ready to fight and win. It is our responsibility to set conditions for continued honorable service to our nation, to innovate and transform, to be ready to prevent or fight another war, and to remain grounded in our strong values. When the nation calls, the Army answers. Long ago, one bleak and wintry morn, when a call rang out for volunteers in a nation being born. No sunshine, patriot speeches, no summer soldiers' songs for the special ones who paid the price to keep our country strong. When we were needed, we were there. Ask us where we've been. From the frozen fields of Valley Forge to a trail called Ho Chi Minh. Through the glory and the sacrifice, we do our jobs and stay. We're citizens and soldiers and army all the way. When we were needed, we were there. Army's commitment to its people is everlasting. We must always show appreciation for the dedication and sacrifice of our soldiers, civilians, and families, and the commitment they make to our nation. The next fight could come any day, so we must be ready. We remain committed to our values and our principles and our mission. People first, winning matters. Please stand and join with me in singing the Army Song. Okay. 
All right, how about another round of applause for these fantastic soldiers? Well, I tell you, that's got to make you feel proud. Troops dismissed. Sit down, relax, <laughs> thanks. Right, that, uh, unbelievable. Thanks to Major General Alan Pepin, uh, Commanding General of the Military District of Washington, Command Sergeant Major Velez, the men and women of the Old Guard, our nation's oldest regular Army regiment, and the men and women of the United States Army Band, Pershing Zone. Uh, you are each incredible and you are collectively inspiring. Just a great job. So proud of them. Uh, unbelievable. Well, Sworn in as a Secretary of the Army on May 28, 2021, Christine Warmoth was immediately thrust into congressional testimony with an Army contending with modernization, rethinking how it places people first, and uh, a reshaping of the conflict in South Asia, Southwest Asia, all the while deployed in 140 countries around the world and supporting domestic opera operations related to the COVID-19 pandemic. She was well prepared for the role and no stranger uh, to the world of national security, formerly serving as Special Assistant to the President of the United States and Senior Director for Defense at the National Security Council, as well as having served as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans, and Forces, and then serving as Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. We're very fortunate to have her with us today to launch the 2021 AUSA Annual Meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the 25th Secretary of the Army, the Honorable Christine Warmoth. Thank you. General Odierno was a warrior, a larger-than-life figure, and he led the Army through some of its most challenging times. I cannot say enough to express my sadness, but we are so incredibly grateful for the legacy he leaves behind, inspiring so many of the leaders we have with us today. I'd also like to thank General Carter Hamm for his five years of service as AUSA president. And before that, for his nearly 38 years of service to the Army and the nation, culminating in his outstanding leadership of AFRICOM. I was lucky enough to work with General Ham, and he has been an invaluable source of counsel. Please join me in thanking him for his great service to AUSA. Carter, thank you for everything you've done for our Army, and my best wishes to you and Christy. I hear you're already hard at work on your honey-do list. <laughs> Congratulations also to General Bob Brown, our new AUSA President and CEO. Bob also served in uniform with distinction for 38 years, and I can't thank you enough in advance for everything I know you're going to do for the country and for the Army. Now, every year is a busy year for our Army, but this year was pretty extraordinary. The Army hasn't just been maintaining readiness and operating in over 140 countries. It's also been crucial to helping our country fight the deadliest pandemic in American history. The Army helped provide the backbone of Operation Warp Speed, which facilitated the development of today's safe and effective COVID vaccines. Army nurses, doctors, and other medical professionals 
raced to care for Americans across the country in the early days of the pandemic. The Army National Guard responded in communities all around the nation. And I am incredibly proud. As Secretary Austin recently said at West Point, we are facing extraordinary circumstances. But extraordinary circumstances are what the Army does. The Army has answered the call in many ways. This year, the Army National Guard provided thousands of soldiers to help secure the Capitol after the January 6th insurrection. Army soldiers are working with DHS and Customs and Border Patrol on the southwest border. Extreme weather caused by climate change resulted in Army soldiers fighting wildfires in the west, aiding Texans without power in an ice storm, and helping Gulf states hit hard by hurricanes. The Army made history, too. Just two months ago, almost 4,000 soldiers from the 82nd Airborne, the 10th Mountain Division, the Minnesota National Guard, and the Special Operations Community helped secure the Kabul airport. Working hand in hand with the Marines and the Air Force, Army soldiers helped to save more than 124,000 American citizens, allies, partners, and Afghans who fought for our values for the past 20 years. They completed, absolutely, let's hear it for them. They completed this unprecedented mission under extraordinarily difficult and dangerous conditions. 13 American service members made the ultimate sacrifice during this operation, including Army Staff Sergeant Ryan Knaus. It's up to all of us to live up to the courage they showed. Today, thousands of Army soldiers on five Army installations across the country are working with the Departments of State, Homeland Security, and NGOs to help Afghan evacuees start new lives here in America. I visited Fort Bliss just three weeks ago and was amazed to see how quickly the Army had built housing for almost 10,000 Afghan evacuees living there. Our talented soldiers figured out how to deliver clothing, meals, medical services, and even to deliver babies. What I saw at Fort Bliss was truly the best of America. Big hearted, like the female soldier I saw hugging and holding a small Afghan child. Welcoming, like the soldiers putting together change of clothing kits for the new arrivals. Inspiring, like the soldiers helping out in an impromptu classroom full of smiling Afghan children. I am so proud of our soldiers for reminding us how much we can do when we come together. We've got a lot to be proud of, but we also have a lot of work to do. We are at an inflection point, a key moment in an incredibly consequential argument between autocrats and those who understand that democracy is the right way to meet the challenges of the 21st century. More than at any other time in my professional life, we are at a strategic crossroads. The Department of Defense understands that China is the pacing challenge. And that means adapting to a dramatically different security environment from the one we faced when I started working at the Pentagon more than 25 years ago. When I first walked into the Pentagon as a civil servant in the wake of the end of the Cold War, you would hear pundits talking about Pax Americana and even the end of history. Boy, did they get that wrong. I had been working on strategy and European issues for six years when Al-Qaeda terrorists flew planes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon itself. I came back from my maternity leave into a burning building and just weeks later, we were at war in Afghanistan. While the United States spent the last 20 years conducting counterinsurgency operations and fighting terrorism, China and Russia went to school on the American way of war. Both China and Russia have steadily modernized their militaries, including building advanced space, cyber, and disinformation capabilities. In the future, if deterrence fails and either China or Russia makes the strategic mistake of threatening our vital interests with military aggression, we can no longer count on having months to project combat power overseas from an uncontested homeland. 
nor can we count on quickly establishing air superiority so that our forces can precisely strike targets with relative impunity. We could even face attacks here on the United States itself. The stakes are high, but we are up to the challenge if we move decisively. I sought this job for a simple reason. I want to make sure that the Army transforms itself to meet these future challenges. And the future is a lot closer than some of us think. Fortunately, the Army has not been standing still. Far from it. We are designing new formations to bring us into the future. We are innovating and experimenting. We are developing new weapon systems so that we remain the world's premier land force. Let me offer a few examples of the shape of tomorrow's Army. We now have six Security Force Assistance Brigades. Elements from these units are being deployed in small teams in multiple countries worldwide. I met at Fort Bragg with the second SFAB, which is aligned to AFRICOM, and I met at JBLM with the fifth SFAB, aligned to Indopaycom. They are hard at work building interoperability and strengthening our unrivaled network of alliances and partnerships. The multi-domain task force is another new formation that positions us to meet future challenges head on. MDTFs give the Army the ability to deliver synchronized, non-kinetic, and kinetic effects over long ranges. MDTFs operate across the spectrum from competition to conflict. Elements of the first task force have already been operating in Indo-PACOM, participating in exercises such as Defender Pacific. And they bring together cyber, space, and information operations with long-range precision fires to disrupt and defeat adversary targets. These task forces can operate from multiple geographically separate locations, making them harder to find and target, and they will have organic protection and sustainment capabilities. We are also building a culture of innovation and experimentation. This week, we are beginning Project Convergence 21, which will bring together participants from the 82nd Airborne and the 1st MDTF. Project Convergence seeks to learn how the joint force will defeat advanced adversaries in a future high-intensity warfight. This year, the Air Force, the Marines, and the Navy will join us down in the dirt, experimenting with more than 100 different technologies. At our outstanding Army Applications Lab in Austin, our team is forming partnerships with small technology companies outside the traditional defense industry, and they are solving real-world Army problems, such as increasing the rate of fire of the self-propelled howitzer. After visiting the lab a few weeks ago, I stopped by another Austin-based new initiative, our software factory. The software factory brings together soldiers across the Army with coding skills, regardless of their MOS or rank, so that they can design problem-solving apps that soldiers can download on their phones. Make no mistake, data and software will be as important as ammunition on the future battlefield. We have also substantially transformed how the Army modernizes and develops new weapon systems. We've partnered the cross-functional teams with our PEOs to ensure strong connections between our operators and our acquisition professionals. And we have placed soldier-centered design at the heart of our modernization process. We're working closely with industry and value the degree to which industry has invested its own R&D dollars to ensure that the Army succeeds. This new approach to modernization is already paying off. This year, we've put enhanced night vision goggles and IVAS into the hands of our soldiers. We fielded the MSHOR ad, and we're assessing two prototypes for the new mobile protected fire system. I've seen firsthand so far how much progress we've already made. In fiscal year 22, we will have prototypes of the directed energy MSHOR ad, LTAMs, and the robotic combat vehicle. We'll field the next generation squad weapon and our new integrated air and missile defense platform, including its new integrated battle command system. Fiscal year 23 will be the year of long range precision fires. 
we'll see the first battery of the new long-range hypersonic weapon that we've developed with the Navy, as well as PRISM and our mid-range capability and the prototype of the extended range cannon artillery. I am very proud of what the Army has accomplished, but we have so much more work ahead. The Army has long been the nation's Swiss Army knife, called upon to respond to any and all unforeseen crises. We still face an array of challenges, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and terrorist groups like ISIS. But one pacing challenge stands out above all, China. And we must transform to meet that challenge. Change is hard when there's uncertainty about what the future will bring and there are no easy changes to make. I feel this pressure myself, but we can no longer defer the big decisions about how to forge the army we need for the future. This means thinking even harder about how to deter and, if necessary, to fight high-end adversaries using the capabilities we already have. It means networking and adapting our existing capabilities in innovative ways, even as we invest in new systems. It means upgraded operational concepts drawn from rigorous analysis, study, and exercises. It means a realistic understanding of our potential adversaries, their ideologies, their capabilities, and the geography where we are most likely to meet them. So today's Army must ask hard questions. How would our foes be likely to fight? With what capabilities? For what reasons? What does that mean for the future of land power? What are the implications for the Army of geography in Europe and the Indo-Pacific? And how can the Army best contribute to the joint war fight? I am not convinced that we have fully thought our way through all of the challenges we may face on the future high-end battlefield if deterrence fails. We need to look harder at key cases such as the Nagorno-Karabakh war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. We need to recognize that bureaucratic infighting, attachment to the way we've always done it, and reflexive skepticism of new ideas can be powerful roadblocks to progress. So we need to be focused. We need to be strategic. And we need to be bold. The Army must ruthlessly prioritize its efforts to find a sustainable strategic path to transformation. Now, I know some would argue that Indo-PACOM should be left to the Air Force and the Navy or see the Army primarily as a bill payer to make more room for space, cyber, and other high-tech capabilities. But the Army has a crucial role to play as part of a joint force that can deter China, Russia, and any other foe while defending the homeland. Of course, it's harder in a time of downward pressure on the defense budget. So we must face hard choices squarely, even as we pursue our transformation agenda. We are going to have to look hard at everything we do and everything about how we do it. To inform these hard decisions, we are conducting analysis right now on key aspects of the Army, our force structure, our readiness, our modernization programs, and our infrastructure so that we can focus our finite resources on transforming to meet future challenges. This work will not be easy, but it is needed. And given the challenges ahead, we may have to accept some risk now to avoid greater risk in the future. But one place we cannot take risk is in taking care of our people. The Army is by nature a people-centric service, and our people truly are our most important weapon system. We need to recruit and retain the very best and take good care of the outstanding people who wear the Army uniform. We welcome into our ranks any qualified American who wants to serve and who can make the grade, and we are committed to treating everyone with dignity and respect. We expect a lot from everyone in our Army, and we ask a lot of our families, too. So we have a solemn obligation to take care of them as well. As General McConville reminds us, we are in a war for talent, 
and he is absolutely right. So we are moving from an industrial age approach to managing talent to a digital one. We are selecting our future leaders differently. Instead of choosing future leaders in a few minutes based on a paper personnel file, we are doing days of blind interviews to make sure we get these critical selections right. This program has been so successful for battalion and brigade commanders that we are expanding it to help us select sergeant majors. Our people also deserve quality housing. We know there's more work to do, but we are making repairs more quickly, hiring more staff to oversee our housing contracts, and working with our housing companies to invest more than a billion dollars of their funds into more renovations and new development. DOD's recent decision to provide an early increase to BAH in 56 housing markets will help Army families across the country with rising housing and rental costs. We will build nine child development centers in the next five years, which will allow us to reduce wait times for childcare. We've also increased compensation for our child care center workers. And we are making it easier for Army families to provide in-home child care, which will increase our child care capacity and make care more accessible. And as a working mom, I know just how important this is. We have to ensure all our soldiers can work in an environment free of harassment and discrimination. It's not just a matter of national principle, it's a matter of national security. We've also got to remain focused on supporting victims of sexual harassment and sexual assault and to keep it out of the Army in the first place. To do this, we're launching a new Fusion Directorate pilot at six active duty Army installations, which will bring under one roof all of our Army resources and provide a more victim-centered approach to our response efforts. And pending final action by Congress, we are prepared to establish a new Office of Special Victims Prosecutors. It will be separate from the chain of command and it will report directly to me. The tragic murder of Vanessa Guillen showed us some things that were badly broken and we are moving fast to fix them. We are transforming our criminal investigative division We've hired a new, deeply experienced civilian director to lead CID, and going forward, 60% of our CID special agents will be civilian. But the point isn't just to respond better to episodes of sexual harassment and sexual assault. It's to stop them from happening in the first place. And that's on all of us. Every leader has to ensure a command climate in which we take care of our soldiers as if they were members of our own family. We've also got to do more to prevent suicide in our ranks. And we've got to end the stigma of seeking help. Getting help is a sign of strength, not weakness. I've seen a counselor myself during tough times and I know how helpful they can be. We cannot have a healthy army unless we take care of our mental health. Ladies and gentlemen, I am incredibly proud of this institution. Our army isn't perfect, but we shouldn't lose sight of its profound importance. The first thing the Constitution says in Article 2, Section 2, is that the President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and the Navy of the United States. And I cannot help notice that we got top billing. However, we need to keep earning our place at the top. And in just four short months in the job, I've seen how we do that every day. I saw it in the determination of a female trainee from Nigeria who faced down her fear of the commando crawl on the Victory Tower at Fort Jackson. I saw it in the excellence of our Army trainers at our Jungle Academy in Hawaii. I saw it in the unrivaled abilities of our Special Operations Forces at Fort Bragg. And I saw it in the speed with which Army soldiers went back into Afghanistan doing their jobs under enormous pressure. We're not just any Army. We're America's Army. We're the Army that defends this remarkable Republic. And we don't just defend the American people. In so many ways, we reflect the American people. I hope that you all are enormously proud of your service. 
I know I am. And I am humbled and honored to have the chance to help write the next chapter of the US, his, of the US Army's history. We've got big challenges ahead. We're going to have to make hard decisions and follow through on them. But the Army has never shied away from a fight, and I know we're not about to start now. So let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. What a great way to start annual meeting 2021. Now let's give out some very well-deserved awards. This morning we will recognize many people for their service to the nation, the Army, and AUSA. To assist in presentation of AUSA's national awards, Brigadier General Jack Haley, United States Army retired, chair of the annual meeting, will join General Brown on the stage. Would Colonel Yardrow please join us on the stage? The Major General Anthony J. Drexel Biddle Medal is presented to Colonel William Glenn Yardrow, Jr., U.S. Army retired, for his outstanding contributions to the Association of the United States Army. Colonel Yarbrough, a former president of AUSA's George Washington chapter, has worked tirelessly on behalf of soldiers, veterans, and their families, and dedicated countless hours to AUSA's efforts to support the Army and those who serve in it. A decorated veteran and Purple Heart recipient with decades of selfless service, Colonel Yarbrough has served AUSA in a variety of roles, from chapter level to national level. He currently serves as the president of AUSA's second region and was a long-term member of the AUSA Finance and Audit Committee. Colonel Yarbrough is known for his unbounded energy, is always the first to volunteer to ensure that a need is met and pours his heart and soul into doing all that he can do for all who serve have served for civilians and for humanity. Colonel Yarbrough's contributions to AUSA and the Army continue, and he is always thinking about what can be done for the betterment of our soldiers and families. In recognition of his innovation and selfless service to further AUSA's mission, we proudly present the Major General Anthony J. Drexel Biddle Medal to Colonel Glenn Yarbrough, Jr., U.S. Army, retired. Would Major General Gerard please join us on stage? The Lieutenant General Raymond S. McLean Medal is awarded to Major General Joseph Gerard, U.S. Army Europe and Africa Deputy Commanding General and Deputy Commanding General for the Army National Guard for his exemplary service and his outstanding contributions to the advancement of the Association of the United States Army's goal of a seamless, multi-component army. Known as a no-nonsense, results-oriented leader and manager who excels at leading people and building teams, throughout his career, Gerard has consistently demonstrated extraordinary leadership skills in key roles, culminating in his current assignment. Previously, Gerard served as the 42nd Adjutant General of Georgia, and before that, Commanding General of the Georgia Army National Guard, under his leadership, the Georgia Army National Guard was selected by Army Forces Command to lead the way in implementing the Army's Associated Unit Program, 
the only state organization to have both division and battalion level associations with the active army. A life member of AUSA since 2011, Gerard has also volunteered with the Rainbow Children's Home in Dahlonega, Georgia, the local Rotary Club, and the Georgia Youth Challenge Academy. He has dedicated his life to serving others, and in particular, soldiers and their families. In appreciation of his outstanding service and dedication to our nation and the Army National Guard, we proudly present the Lieutenant General Raymond S. McLean Medal to Major General Joseph F. Gerard. Would Lieutenant Colonel Dias please join us on stage? The Major General James Earl Rudder Medal is awarded to Lieutenant Colonel John L. Dias, U.S. Army retired, and Army Reserve Ambassador Emeritus for Tennessee for his outstanding contributions to the advancement of the Association of the United States Army's goal of a seamless, multi-component army. Colonel Dias's contributions include recruiting efforts in conjunction with Army recruiters across Tennessee, building relationships with employers of Army Reserve soldiers, and maximizing community leader and civilian law enforcement attendance at Operation Guardian Shield. Dias is also an active member of AUSA and is a driving force in his local chapter for fundraising and supporting soldiers and families from Tennessee. His dedication has produced enduring, significant, and progressive changes to the Army Reserve. In appreciation of his outstanding service and dedication to our nation, the Army Reserve, we proudly present the Major General James Earl Rudder Medal to Lieutenant Colonel John L. Dias, U.S. Army, retired. <laughs> Would Command Sergeant Major Thomas please join us on stage? The Sergeant Major of the Army, William G. Bainbridge Medal, is presented to Command Sergeant Major Donald Thomas, United States Army, retired, for his exceptional service to the non-commissioned officer corps. Drafted into the Army in 1971, Thomas was a military police soldier who led at every level from squad leader to Command Sergeant Major of U.S. Forces Korea and 8th Army. During his military service, he developed a well-deserved reputation as a caring soldier who emphasized self and professional development, leader competence, and encouraged lifelong learning, developing Army, Joint, and Coalition partner leaders. His legacy will last for generations. After retiring from the Army, Command Sergeant Major Thomas worked at AUSA where he continued to serve and mentor soldiers and traveled extensively throughout the Army conducting professional development sessions for leaders at every level. He was instrumental in establishing the AUSA-sponsored Sergeant Major Larry Strickland Memorial Fund and Scholarship, which is presented to NCOs who are working to continue their education and has been inducted into the Military Police Corps Regimental Hall of Fame and the Sergeant Major Academy's Hall of Fame. In grateful recognition of his demonstrated exceptional leadership and the highest ideals of duty and character, we proudly present the Sergeant Major of the Army William G. Bainbridge Medal to Command Sergeant Major Donald Thomas, U.S. Army, retired. Would James Martin please join us on stage?
The Joseph P. Cribbins Medal is presented to James Martin, Dean and Professor Emeritus, U.S. Army Commander General Staff College, for his exemplary service to the Army. Dr. Martin played a key role in establishing academic policies, plans, programs, and procedures for the Command and General Staff College, one of the Army's two graduate colleges. He is a subject matter expert on adult education and educational administration for Army University, Army Training and Doctrine Command. And in his role at Army University, Dr. Martin provided broad expertise on ex issues concerning professional military education and academic programs. Dr. Martin led the creation, planning, and execution of the Bachelor of Arts in Leadership and Workforce Development at the Sergeant's Major Academy, the first undergraduate degree granted in the Army outside of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and the first bachelor's degree in any enlisted service school in DOD. Dr. Martin is also active in the local community, teaching classes on international relations and regional geography at churches in the Kansas City area, sponsoring international military students at CGSC, and participating in a virtual story time series for the Fort Leavenworth community during the COVID-19 lockdown. It is with profound gratitude and appreciation that we present the Joseph P. Cribbins Award to James B. Martin, a distinguished Army civilian. Would the Dixon family please join us on stage? The AUSA Volunteer Family of the Year Award for promoting the well-being of soldiers and their family members is presented to the family of First Sergeant Justin Dixon of the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. First Sergeant Dixon and his wife, Tawny, who have a son named Cameron, spend hundreds of hours volunteering and giving back to the military community. In the last two years, Justin Dixon has volunteered more than 350 hours of his time. He founded a Facebook outreach group for veterans to connect and enjoy the outdoors. He works to provide equipment and fishing trips for wounded warriors from the Fort Bragg area. Tawny Dixon has volunteered more than 600 hours working with the Armed Services YMCA to organize food drives and raise money for hygiene items for families in need and initiated a program which recognizes high school family members of 82nd Airborne soldiers for their volunteer work. She also served as a soldier and family readiness group leader and volunteers with the 82nd Airborne Division's integration course, helping families new to the division and Fort Bragg. It is with sincere gratitude and appreciation that we present our Volunteer Family of the Year Award to this remarkable Army family. <laughs> Would James Schenck please join us on stage? The John W. Dixon Award for Outstanding Contributions to National Defense by a member of the industrial community is awarded to James Schenck, President and CEO of PenFed Credit Union, America's second largest Fedic Greener Union, serving 2.3 million members worldwide. Since becoming CEO in April 2014, James Schenck has led PenFed's asset and membership growth. In the first quarter of 2021, PenFed donated nearly $1 million to charitable organizations, primarily supporting national defense. A graduate of West Point and Harvard Business School, James Schenck is an advocate for military and veterans' issues. He has been honored by the National Military Family Association for his support for military family programs 
and canine companions for independence for his work to expand programs for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. The PenFed Foundation in Alexandria, Virginia is the nonprofit organization that works to help military community members secure their financial future. Since 2001, the foundation has provided more than $38 million in financial support to veterans, service members, families, and caregivers. In March 2020, the foundation launched a COVID-19 relief program for service members and veterans. In recognition of his philanthropic support for the men and women of our armed forces and their families, we proudly present the John W. Dixon Award to James Schenck. Accepting the award for USAA, would Amish Bakaria please join us on stage? The AUSA National Service Award is presented to USAA for exemplary service and demonstrated enduring support to the American soldier and the United States Army community. Based in San Antonio, USAA is known as a pillar in the community for its tireless efforts to support U.S. Army soldiers, spouses, and family members, as well as all members of the military service. Their efforts locally are only a small portion of their national endeavors, community service, and impact upon our soldiers. Founded in 1922, when 25 Army officers got together in San Antonio and pooled their money to form an association to protect and ensure one another when no one else would, USAA is known for its commitment to its members. Since 1998, USAA Bank and the USAA Foundation have contributed $2.9 million to support Army emergency relief. USAA has also provided support to AUSA programs, contributing to date a total of $250,000 to the SMA Leon Van Autrieff Scholarship Fund and support the family program forums. Most recently, USAA donated donated $30 million to 24 organizations to help troops, veterans, and their families struggling with the COVID-19 pandemic. In grateful appreciation for its dedicated service to men and women in uniform and their families, we present the National Service Award to USAA. Now it gives us great pleasure to present AUSA Chapter Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, the AUSA Award for the largest membership for the 2020-2021 operating year goes again to the Central Texas Fort Hood Chapter. Accepting the award for the Central Texas Fort Hood Chapter, Kelly Brown, Chapter President. Lieutenant General Robert White, Commanding General, Three Corps, and Command Sergeant Major Cliff Rogoy, Command Sergeant Major, Three Corps. We would now like to recognize our Army's divisions for their outstanding membership accomplishments this past year. This year, the Active Duty Division Award for the largest active duty membership goes to the 1st Cavalry Division, Fort Hood, Texas. Accepting the award for 1st Cavalry Division, Major General John B. Richardson, Commanding General, 1st Cavalry Division. Command Sergeant Major Shade S. Monday, Command Sergeant Major, 1st Cavalry Division. And Kelly Brown, 
chapter president. We have two awards to honor reserve components that through their participation and membership have been outstanding in support of the association's mission of keeping America's Army strong. The award for the National Guard Division with the most AUSA members goes to the 42nd Infantry Rainbow Division, New York and New Jersey. Accepting the award for the 42nd Infantry Division is retired Command Sergeant Major Robert Van Pelt, former Command Sergeant Major of the 42nd, immediate past president of the Capital District of New York, AUSA chapter, and recipient of the 2018 Command Sergeant Major Bainbridge Medal. The award to the Major U.S. Army Reserve Command with the greatest support to AUSA as measured by membership and active support to and from the chapters within the command's footprint goes to the 99th Readiness Division, Joint Base McGuire-Dix, Lakehurst, New Jersey. Accepting the award, Major General Rodney L. Falk, Commanding General, 99th Readiness Division, and Sergeant Major Sandra Cook, Interim Command Sergeant Major, 99th Readiness Division. And now, presentation of the Best Chapter Awards. These awards recognize those chapters whose outstanding service to their members, their communities, and the Army earned them the distinction of best in their class this past year. Their successes represent a team effort by the chapter and their local military and business leaders. We categorize our best chapter competition based upon size. Individuals accepting the award will do so on the stage. The AUSA Board of Directors awards that recognize the best chapters overall from all categories go to the following chapters. For first place in the largest category, chapters which began the year with over 1,000 individual, life, and community partner members. The winner is the Fort Bragg chapter. Accepting for the Fort Bragg chapter, CW3 retired Ariel Aponte, Chapter President. Command Sergeant Major retired Andrew McFowler, immediate past Chapter President. And Command Sergeant Major retired Jimmy Spencer, Chapter Vice President. In the category of chapters between 600 and 999 members, the winners are the Arsenal of Democracy, Indiana, and Fort Leonard Wood, Mid-Missouri chapters. Accepting for the Arsenal of Democracy chapter, Brigadier General retired Mark Mudjar, Captain President, accompanied by Major General Darren Werner, Commanding General, U.S. Army Tank Automotive and Armaments Command and Major General Paul Rogers, Adjutant General, Michigan National Guard, and Command Sergeant Major Jerry Charles, TACOM Command Sergeant Major. <music> Accepting for the Indiana chapter is Dr. Cynthia Gatto, Chapter President and Command Sergeant Major Retired Doug Gibbons, State President.
accepting for the Fort Leonard Wood, Mid-Missouri Chapter. Command Sergeant Major Retired Merle Jones, Chapter President, accompanied by Command Sergeant Major Randolph de la Pena, Command Sergeant Major Maneuver Support Center of Excellence. In our category of chapters with between 350 and 599 members, the winner is the Texas Capital Area Chapter. Accepting for the Texas Capital Area Chapter, Colonel Retired Gary Patterson, Chapter President, and General John M. Murray, Commanding General, U.S. Army Futures Command. In the category of chapters starting the year with between 200 and 349 individual life and community partner members, the winner is the Marne chapter. Accepting for the Marne chapter, Sergeant First Class retired Franklin Rick Schreihofer, chapter president, Carla Schreihofer, immediate past president, and Major General Charles D. Costanza, Commanding General, 3rd Infantry Division, and Command Sergeant Major Quentin B. Fenderson, Command Sergeant Major, 3rd Infantry Division. In our category for chapters with less than 200 members, the winner is the White Sands Missile Range Chapter. Accepting for White Sands Missile Range is Kevin Cardoza, Chapter President. Accompanied by Major General James Gallivan, Commanding General, U.S. Army Test and Evaluation Command. And Command Sergeant Major Ronald Graves, Command Sergeant Major, U.S. Army Test and Evaluation Command. In the Best Overseas Chapter category, the winner is the General Creighton Abrams Chapter. Accepting for the General Abrams Chapter is Colonel Retired Dave Fulton, Chapter President, General Christopher Cavoli, Commanding General, U.S. Army Europe and Africa, Command Sergeant Major Robert Abernethy, Command Sergeant Major, U.S. Army Europe and Africa, and Gemma McGowan, Chapter Vice President. with the representatives from the following chapters who were selected as runners-up for Best Chapter Awards, please stand and be recognized. George Washington, Major General Harry Green, Aberdeen, Rock Island Arsenal, Major Samuel Woodfill, Space Coast, Delaware, Leonidas Polk, this concludes the awards presentations, and please give everyone a big hand. Well, incredibly well-deserved awards all the way around. Uh, thanks so much for allowing us to recognize that great work out there from chapters and then in our individual recipients, uh, just fantastic. Uh, the support they provide, uh, for the American soldier is just incredible, and we're so proud. You know, uh, no doubt it takes an incredible commitment and uh, ded by dedicated and caring volunteers to merit a Best Chapter Award uh, and all the efforts that go into it. So again, thank you so much. Uh, really proud of all our recipients.
I want to acknowledge some other attendees in the audience this morning. We have the civilian aides to the Secretary of the Army, our CASAs. You raise your hands, recognize our CASAs. Thanks for being here. Outstanding, all they do out there in the community for us. And then we have representatives from over 60 nations, our allies and partners. Raise your hands, allies and partners. Thanks for being here. So important. We have an exciting and busy annual meeting for you this year. You know, obviously, safety is our number one priority, so there's some things that will be different, but it's going to be great, I assure you. It's going to be great. So again, welcome to your annual meeting. Have a wonderful experience, and this concludes the opening session.